we're going to continue looking at linear regression and look at slope and y-intercept today. We're going to start with the slope. And if you remember from algebra, slope is rise over run. So the change in y over the change in x. And that doesn't really change here. So the formula that we're going to use is b sub 1, because that's how we look at slope now. Instead of m, we're using b sub 1, equals r times the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x, where r is your correlation coefficient, s sub y is the standard deviation of just the y values, and s sub x is the standard deviation of just the x values. So if you have those three things, then we can calculate the slope of our line of best fit. Then we're going to look at the y-intercept. So the y-intercept also has a formula that we can use, but before we talk about that, we have to remember that the line of best fit will always cross the mean point, which is x bar comma y bar. Knowing that helps us use the equation to calculate the y-intercept. So the equation for the y-intercept is b sub 0 equals y bar minus b sub 1 times x bar where x bar and y bar come from our mean point, and b sub 1 is our slope. So we first have to calculate the slope, and then once we have the slope, we use the slope with our mean point to calculate the y-intercept. And then we can plug them into the equation, and we get our linear regression, or our line of best fit. When we do this, we still have to check assumptions and conditions. So to be able to calculate the line of best fit, or the linear regression, we have to check these. They have not changed, so we have the quantitative variable condition, which states that both variables are quantitative, meaning that they have units. Straight enough condition, so you want to check the scatter plot before you start this, if you can. If you don't have the data, then we can't check it, but if we have the data, we have to check that the scatter plot is straight enough. And then we have to check that there are no outliers. If there are outliers, we would have to calculate the linear regression both with and without the outliers. So let's look at an example. We're going to keep talking about the Burger King example. So in a scatter plot that plots the amount of protein from a Burger King burger versus the amount of fat from a Burger King burger, we get that the mean fat content is 23.5 grams and the standard deviation of 16.4. The mean protein content is 17.2 grams with a standard deviation of 14, and we have a correlation coefficient of 0.83. We can take this information and then create our linear equation. We can use the mean fat and mean protein to create our mean point, and then use the standard deviation with the correlation coefficient and calculate our slope. So we always have to start by calculating the slope. So our slope, we calculate as b sub 1 equals r, which was 0.83, times the standard deviation of y, which is 16.4, because y is our fat, and that was the standard deviation for the fat, divided by 14, which is the standard deviation of x, which is the standard deviation for the protein. This gives us a slope of 0 0.97. Then, using our mean point, which was 17.2 comma 23.5, because Again, protein is our x, and the mean protein was 17.2. y is our fat, and our mean fat content was 23.5. We plug that into the b sub 0 equation. So we get 23.5 minus our slope, 0 0.97, times the 17.2. This gives us a y-intercept of 6.8. So then our overall equation is the predicted fat content. It's still predicted, so fat gets to wear a hat, equals 6.8 plus 0 0.97 times our protein. Again, we plug in the fat and the protein into the equation instead of using x and y, because this gives our equation context. And we are always trying to include context into everything, because context is important. So now that we've calculated the equation, what does the equation tell us? We're going to start with the slope, and the slope tells us how the variable changes in the units of y per x. So in our Burger King situation, we're going to say, on average, every gram of protein adds 0 0.97 grams of predicted fat. The way this works is that it, we always have to say on average, because it's just an average of the data that we have. So on average, 
each unit of x adds or increases or decreases depending on the sign of the slope. The value of the slope using the units of y for the predicted y value. And we have to say predicted because we don't know the actual y value. It is a prediction. So what this means, let's go back and look at the actual equation. So what this means is that if I'm interpreting my slope, the 0 0.97, I multiply that by the protein. So every time I add the pro add one gram of protein, I'm multiplying that by 0 0.97. And that's being added to the fat. So on average, each additional gram of protein will add 0 0.97 grams of predicted fat. So that's what that means because you're taking each gram of protein and multiplying it by the slope and then that gets added to the fat content. The y-intercept tells us the value that we have when x equals 0. Most often this is pointless. Sometimes the y-intercept does make sense but it most likely is only serving as a starting point and not actually a prediction value. It just makes the equation work. It doesn't actually give us a good prediction value. Let's look at another example. Looking at the relationship between house prices in thousands of dollars and house size in thousands of square feet, we get the regression model, the predicted price equals 9.56 plus 122.74 times the size. We want to know what is the slope of 122.64 mean? Well, it tells us that on average, for every thousand square feet, my x is the size and size is in thousands of square feet, the predicted house, so the predicted price, increases because slope is positive by $122.64,000. So without the explanation, we just say that on average, every thousand square feet, the predicted house price will increase by $122.64,000. Now, because the x and y units are the same, we really could take out the thousands uh, and deal with it as a one-to-one -one situation, but it doesn't always work out that the units are the same like this, or at least on the same scale. So typically, you'll want to keep the units as they are, but when they are one-to-one, -one, we could have said that on average, for every square foot, the predicted house price increases by $122.64, and we could have taken out the thousand because it is the same uh, scale. But that doesn't always work out, so it's typically a safer bet to include what the actual unit is instead of scaling it down. Which brings us to what are the units for the slope? Well, the units for slope is always the y units divided by the x units. So in this case, it's thousands of dollars per thousands of square feet. Or again, because it is one-to-one, -one, we could have said dollars per square foot. So then how much would you expect to pay for a 3,000 square foot home? Well, we plug three because we're dealing in thousands. So I scale that down to just three. We plug that into the equation. And we get that a 3,000 square foot home would cost around $377.78,000. All right, that is it for today. We'll talk more about this in class. Uh, and we'll continue working with the diamond size and diamond price example. But I will see you guys tomorrow, and I hope you had a great night.